So welcome everyone to the first Sliva lunch lecture, I believe. Uh, my name is Maya Oswaldich, and today it is our great pleasure to welcome at the IOA Dr. Leo Manovich. I will try to squeeze his vast credentials into a compact intro to briefly lay out the context for his talk today. Yeah. So Leo but Manovich, please, na 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 nano intro, please. Na intro. Exactly, nano intro, nano intro. I promise, nano, I promise. Please, two minutes, two you minutes. Okay. Oh, oh my so, God. Okay. So Leo Manovic is the presidential professor at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York and a director of the Cultural Analytics Lab, formerly known as Software Studies Initiative, uh, that works on the analysis and visualization of big cultural data. His interest spans uh, over cultural analytics, meaning the analysis of contemporary global culture using data science methods, as well as artificial intelligence and culture, uh, computational social science, digital humanities, digital culture, vi vi visual culture, and media theory. He has been working with computer media as an artist, computer animator, uh, designer, and programmer uh, already since 1984. His art projects have been presented by the New York Public Library, Google Site Guys 2014, Shanghai 2014 Art and Architecture Biennale, Chelsea Art Museum, uh, uh, Kiasma in Helsinki, Centre Pompidou in Paris, ICA in London, and Graphic Design Museum, among many others. So Leomanovic is also the author of 15 books, including AI Aesthetics, Theories of Software Culture, Instagram and Contemporary Image, Software Takes Command, uh, Soft Cinema Navigating the Database, and The Language of New Media, which was described as the most suggestive and broad-ranging media history since Marshall McLuhan. His latest publication is called Cultural Analytics. I'm still waiting for it. And it was published in four. Oh, you, uh, it's, oh, you mean it's, ship, it's, in, uh, it's shipping. It's yeah. on the way. It's on the way. Oh, it's going to come. Okay. okay. It's, come. it's not, it's, not, it's worth waiting. It's nice object, really nice object. Then. Nice mm -hmm. heavy object. Then. No, I'm not upset. as big as, not as big, it's not as big as LSM XL, but you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but still, still took 15 years to, sorry, but, but you know, I think that took 20 years. Mine took like 15 years. Yeah, to, to get, okay. Yeah. So no, I'm really, I mean, I'm really excited about that one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, can't wait. It's gonna be Christmas when it's coming, you know? So it's gonna be a nice yes. Christmas present. Okay. So in times when data starts to drive operations, it's, it is not exclusively the programmers anymore, but the data itself that defines what to do next. So what does data want? This is the title of today's lecture. And again, it is our great pleasure to welcome, and I hand over my screen to Lau Manovich. Thank you so much, Maya. Greetings, everybody. Uh, I love uh, you know, giving talk or just interacting with students so, at architecture schools. Oh. Oh. Somebody, what, what? Sorry, somebody. Can I ask, could I ask everybody please to turn off your mics? That would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, I love to, I love, and actually I think this is maybe the fifth talk for, like, even though I have no formal connection to architecture, I don't know why arch architects seem to be interested in my work this year, because this is like fifth talk I'm giving for architecture school. Uh, so let me start, uh, you know, with sometimes, uh, I watch videos of my talks and I can spend two thirds of the time on introduction warming up. So let me try to go directly into the talk. Okay, let's do that. Okay, here we go. Um, so one thing about, one thing about um, you know, Keynote is that I think if I try to do play, right, in Keynote, it doesn't work very well with Zoom. So I kind of have to leave, I have to leave, uh, you know, this, uh, this view. Uh, so I was trying to think about subtitle, uh, you know, for today. So it can be something like statistics, artificial intelligence, and study of culture. And um, as Maya mentioned, uh, my latest book, Cultural Analytics, has been published about a month ago. Um, so in the talk, you'll see, you know, a bit of research from this book, 
but I'm also now going forward, and in fact, I'm writing the article which critiques the book, right? Uh, or simply, let's say, goes forward uh, because the book is based on my work and thinking between 2005 and, let's say, 2016. Uh, as many people, I was incredibly excited during this period about the new possibilities to study culture and society using big data. You know, and um, after about 10 years, I started to wonder and uh, to see some big challenges or limitations, uh, whatever you want to put it. Uh, so I will talk about both these possibilities uh, and the challenges which we have. Okay. Um, so this is, you know, the key ideas, are kind of, or key questions, right? Both in the book and uh, what I'll try to talk about today. So can we use big cultural data without aggregation summarization? Basically without statistics. How to think about culture, including urbanism, design, architecture, without categories, right? Um, can we learn from computers to understand the world differently? Right, so if AI uh, gives us perhaps not, instead of using AI, right, to kind of simulate human perception, human cognition, human understanding world, can we uh, think of AI as a kind of alien because it is an alien? And finally, can we work with big data about numbers? Um, so just, you know, a bit of my biography. Uh, so I was born in Moscow. Uh, I studied in the Moscow Architecture Institute in the late 70s. Uh, and by the way, uh, we're building an institute was the same building where the famous Russian Hutimas school uh, was running in the 1920s. And those of you who don't know, Hutimas was as important uh, at the time as Bauhaus, except it had many more students. It had about 2,500 students and 100 faculty. So all the kind of Russian avant-garde designers, photographers, artists, architects were teaching there. Uh, but because it was closed by Stalin in 1930, you know, it didn't become so famous. Um, so uh, for about 20 years, I was a professor of digital art. Um, and then once I started to get the how we can use data to study culture. I taught myself statistics. I taught myself data science. 11 years ago, I didn't even know how to operate Excel. Uh, I mean, I taught myself R, which is you know, the leading kind of open source uh, language for data analysis. Um, and then in 2013, I was invited to New York and I became professor of computer science. So now I'm teaching PhD seminars with computer science students even though I haven't taken a single formal computer science class in my life. Uh, so um, today, uh, with data science and data, I used to analyze contemporary culture in both in professional fields and also in dozens of academic fields. Uh, and the talk with Maya, you know, before, this, before I started, uh, that it's very important to understand uh, what happens in industry. And indeed, you know, the data, data analysis, uh, artificial intelligence, image processing, text processing, uh, you know, geodata processing is the new engine of culture and media. So the companies, right, uh, which do marketing research, analyze consumer preferences, or work on new product development, and analyze online and physical behaviors, right, all rely on data analysis. It's not only Google, Instagram, Facebook, you know, Amazon, and so on but it's tens of thousands of companies which you know, ever do it themselves or by uh, this analysis you know, from our companies. Uh, but the data is also used, for example, by nonprofits such as museum universities, right? So university may have a, some kind of predictive analytics model to try to predict perhaps how many students will enroll next semester. Uh, museums are publishing papers to talk about how we analyze uh, eye movements for visitors and uh, maybe try to figure out how to like, construct exhibitions better. Uh, and of course, uh, in different areas of computer science, people also do this research, uh, and perhaps I'll show you examples. And then there's everything else. Uh, there are also tens of thousands of very interesting papers, right, which use big data in urban planning and urban studies fields. Uh, so it also touches upon you know, your studies. So in 2005, uh, you know, when I started to think about it, I wanted to come up with a term 
for this research because I expected this research to grow a lot, which is what happened. And in 2007, I came out of the term kind of cultural analytics. So now this term also appears where are you know, job listings for it. And in 2017, some colleagues started a whole journal for cultural analytics. And uh, I will show you just examples of a couple of papers, but here, here I just simply uh, wrote the titles of a small selection of papers, which I selected from basically hundreds of thousands of relevant papers. And I think the titles themselves show you uh, how all kinds of different aspects of culture, different medias can be used, right? Studying data. So you can look at cultural history over thousands, over 2000 years. Uh, you can look at the diffusion of concepts around the world, how concepts travel um, uh, in this 2017 paper, which used 1 billion Facebook photographs. Uh, there's a whole area uh, on computational fashion where people try to predict kind of fashion trends uh, or, but in this particular paper, people look at 100 million images, uh, again, from Instagram, and basically try to determine uh, the kind of popular clothing styles worldwide, right? So not what, uh, what, not what you see, not what you see in fashion magazine, fashion shows, but what the people wear worldwide, right? Uh, I will show you a couple of these papers, um, so I'm not going to continue. So it's my first example, which I selected to also demonstrate that this research is done today not only by academics and by companies, but also by journalists. Um, so here is uh, a beautiful kind of multimedia project, which was published in New York Times. Um, couple of years ago. It's called Why uh, Songs of the Summer Sound the Same. So we basically used uh, the Billboard 100, right, which is the American kind of listing service, which uh, gets sales, right, and ratings and publishes, like, right, top 100, top 200, and so on songs. I mean, we do it for different audiences, for global market, but in this case, we selected the data for you know, like 40 years uh, for the top 100 songs, which were top songs in America, right, in terms of sales uh, during summers. And then we used, right, you know, the, the data from one of the most popular commercial music streaming applications, Spotify. So Spotify has a catalog of about you know, 40 million songs and it extracts about 14 features from every song. So I think it features some kind of compressed representation of some aspects of a song. So for example, like volume or a tempo, or you know, can you dance to the song, right? So Spotify has this data for all the songs and anybody can write a short program and go download the data. So we downloaded the data and we only selected five features, loudness, energy, sensibility, acousticness, uh, and uh, violence, how cheerful the song sounds, and that gives us five dimensions, right? So now you can represent every song as a kind of oval on these five dimensions. Right? So every song now has a kind of fingerprint. Right? Uh, I mean, the whole project has maybe 30 pages, I'm just showing a few. So here they superimpose these fingerprints, right, for uh, popular songs, right, most popular songs, for each summer. And uh, we also kind of measured, right, how different or how similar are these fingerprints from each other. I'm using some simple statistical measures. And in order for you to see it more clearly, I mean, you can kind of see it with your own eyes, but to see it more clearly, we also colorized it. Uh, so yellow means all the songs of the summer are more similar and uh, violet means they're more different. And what you can see is that, uh, after a certain time, right, after a certain period, uh, which is basically in this case, we show you late 2000s and early 2010s, the songs are much, much right, during each summer, much more similar to each other than before. Uh, and then um, you can make this kind of graph, right? So now what you do is you uh, get the average measure, right, of how similar or dissimilar are songs every summer, and you plot it. Uh, and what you see is that from 1970 to about 2000, like, there is not really much change, right? I mean, there is some variations, but you don't have some big trend. 
And then suddenly something happens around 2000, where uh, suddenly the songs in each summer become more similar to each other, and this goes up. And then after about 2014, the trend reverses. So to me, it's a kind of perfect example how you can use uh, computational analysis, in this case, sonic information and statistical tools in data visualization to look at the long-term cultural trends. Uh, so as long as you have available data, and that's usually the most difficult part, you can also imagine doing this analysis for many aspects of architecture and urbanism. Right? Uh, for example, you know, what is the trends in the building heights worldwide over the last 150 years? Uh, what is the proportion of buildings you know, in every city in different architectural styles? Uh, I mean, you can do this analysis of urban plans, right? You can do this analysis of city versus suburb, right? Infrastructure and so on and so forth. So one, one direct right, example, like what you would do kind of using this paper as a model, right? So if you get some of this data on architecture or urbanism, right? Uh, you can basically also look at the changes in uh, variability, right? Or diversity per year. So for example, if you select a you know, particular area, a particular country or particular type of architecture, right? If you get data on all the buildings or all the urban plans, you can see is the urban design becomes more varied over time, right? Uh, I mean, some of these things, of course, right? We can see our own eyes. And architectural historians can tell us a lot, right? So we can learn about the arrival of international style in the 1950s, which uh, by 60s to 70s becomes the default style in the West, and then later becomes default style in Asia. Uh, you know, and uh, today, right, if you look a lot, you know, if you go a lot, right? If you go around the world and you visit various cafes, restaurants, co-working spaces, I think there's a new kind of uh, new international style, which I call kind of friendly minimalism, right? all this uh, kind of white interiors, exposed brick walls, uh, I see it everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, we can't visit millions of locations, or even thousands of locations, right? And our perceptions can be subjective. Uh, so that's why I got very excited in 2005 about doing this kind of research. Uh, but if I want to look at cultural trends, if I want to compare cities, if I want to compare neighborhoods, if I want to look at architecture, urbanism, music, painting, film over time, I can do this kind of approach. Um, so this is just to show you one more example. So this is a, this paper uses uh, like a network science, right? Uh, with multiple study of networks and a data set of almost half a million uh, professional artists. Uh, the paper was published, right, in a very prestigious scientific, the most prestigious scientific journal, which is Nature. Uh, and um, what we've done is that uh, by professional artists, we mean artists who have at least one exhibition in a kind of you know, professional commercial gallery. Uh, so this data for about 30 years. So what we did is we're not uh, getting some evaluations from outside by simply organizing this data in a kind of network, right? So if an artist exhibits here, when the artist exhibits here, you can connect this so it becomes like a nodes of a network, right? Like a social Facebook is a network of people who friends by whom, but here you can connect galleries and museums if people kind of, if the same people exhibit in both places, right? Even using this network representation, we derived a kind of measure of prestige. So that's also very interesting, right? But you know, but in this case, you can say this measure of prestige was kind of derived objectively, right? From the data itself, uh, which was represented in this network form as opposed to for some experts. So what we found out is something interesting, right? What we found out is that, and, maybe, and I wonder if it also applies to architects, right? That nobody has done the studies so far. So what we found is that if people had their first five exhibitions in a kind of more prestigious places, what we call high initial prestige, most of them stay in these high prestigious places for the next, for the next few decades, right? But if people had their first exhibitions in a low prestige places, you know, maybe you have some like apartment exhibition or some nonprofit gallery. I mean, it works, of course, a bit differently, right? What prestigious would be in Europe because you have Kunsthalles. Uh, and if you apply this to architecture, maybe you can also, I mean, you can apply this to any career. You can say, okay, what are the first companies where you went to work for, right? So maybe if you want to work for like Greg Lee or Zaha Hadid or, you know, or uh, UN Studio or Med Architects, 
you know, maybe, I mean, maybe anecdotally, it already means that you guaranteed like a good career, but, but it would be interesting to look at the data, right? And does it also work differently in different countries, for example, again, we don't know, I'm just speculating. But basically in the case of this artist, people who have their first exhibitions in low prestige, in low prestige uh, places, right? You know, when mo almost like only 10% were able eventually to have like a very big career, right? In, and conversely, right, if you look at these people who had their first five exhibitions in high prestige places, less than 0-2% dropped, right? So that's also very interesting, right? It kind of tells you a lot about, I think, the art world and why I haven't become professional artist because I can hate, I hate the art world, right? Uh, because you can see that um, it's so much about networking in a very little sense. Uh, so once you start exhibiting, right, in high prestigious places, you know, you basically, your value kind of never drops, right? Um, okay, let's continue. Okay, so let's keep this one, skip this one. Okay, so um, uh, the amount of this kind of, the, the number of papers, right? The papers can be published in professional journals or represented conferences uh, in computer science, you know, social science and so on, right? It is different fields. The number of papers which use data to investigate culture is basically millions, right? So this is actually not with last year, this is not up to date. So I did a search on Google Scholar. So Google Scholar, it's a good place, right? Google tried to uh, make, get, you know, get, make the index of all the academic papers I can find. So it's kind of Google search for academic papers. So I did a search for Instagram. Uh, so basically papers which analyze Instagram. So some of them try to analyze how, for example, presence of faces, may increase the chances of images getting more likes. Some of them may look at uh, different Instagram behavior of people of different genders, different age groups. Some of them may try to improve recommendation service, um, right? So here we get 7,000 papers. Uh, and then there's a whole area, right? Because, the data, because certain data is available, there are whole research areas, right? Which uh, arrive, which develop around this data. So you can get certain data about tourist behavior, right? Um, but actually a couple of companies, at least used to be companies in Europe, to, you know, telecommunication companies like in Spain, sharing mobile data, researchers, not the actual content of phone calls, but basically anonymized data, right? But somebody, you know, somebody, you know, kind of, uh, anonymous data about kind of people presence, right? The GPS data was shared a few years ago, maybe not now. Um, and then I think the big bank in Spain also shared anonymized being translation data with researchers, you know, and now you have 19,000 papers, which I basically try to analyze tourist behavior using this kind of data. Yeah. Um, there's another area called aesthetic computing, which is actually much larger than 10,000. And here I put some limiting keywords. And the here the idea is to use kind of big data and artificial intelligence to uh, teach a computer to uh, look right at the artwork or design or architecture, right, whatever we want aesthetically, and give the same aesthetic judgments as a human. Um, and so this work is fueled by the availability of human data. So people notice around 2007 that already we had these professional websites, professional networks online, um, right? And that was before Instagram. Now you can use Instagram, but already you had Flickr. Uh, and were particular professional photo websites where uh, professional photographers or amateurs would rate each photograph on a scale of one to 10. So we got a data set of a few hundred thousand papers and these ratings, and then you know, we write algorithms or train neural networks right, uh, to look at the images, to analyze them in terms of color, shape, line orientations, texture, and so on. And then basically train the network to try to predict the same aesthetic scores. Right, so here we have what I call static AI, right, as opposed to transferring to a computer human cognitive abilities, uh, which are things like language translation, language understanding, right, um, here or, or kind of understanding the content of images in video, here we're trying to simulate human kind of static reactions, human aesthetic perception. Okay, let's keep this. Uh, so when I started this work myself, right, um, I defined a very utopian, right, very utopian vision, 
So the idea was to try to observe in real time, analyze and visualize all contemporary global culture, right? Uh, you know, all the trends in book publishing and cinema and architecture and urbanism, uh, fashion and so on. And uh, the reason I kind of was able to have this very really utopian idea is that, I, you know, that was even before social networks became popular. Uh, but I thought, you know, every cultural organization, every architecture school, for example, right, every museum, every creator, every designer, right, has a website. So I said, why not, you know, use computers to go and scrape information from all these websites, the way Google, for example, right, scrapes information from every web, web page it can find, you know, and then builds an index, which is used in search. But in my case, I didn't want to just give you a search engine for culture. I wanted to visualize this information on a kind of giant screens. Um, and I used, um, I kind of took my ideas also from a few different scientific fields, right? Uh, and I will show you just, you know, references to one of this field called scientometrics. So scientometrics is a field which is developed already in the late 50s. And uh, it's based on the idea that in the, in the academic publishing, especially in sciences, I forgot how many science papers are published this year, how many millions, but you know, we're talking about a big number of millions of papers, right? There is a very formal uh, system of citation. So you're supposed to cite, right? Like all the references and you're supposed to include, include a section, which is with overview of research. Like in, in architecture, right? A painting or photography, of course, we also influenced by people, uh, but, but there, is not, there is no requirement to formally cite these people, right? Maybe we borrow consciously, we borrow unconsciously, but in science, right? Because science has really had these methods, uh, which are supposed to eventually allow you to find something about something, right? Some ideas you could build in on previous work with this formal system of citation. So when uh, somebody had the idea in around 1955, that you can analyze the citations, uh, so you can analyze science as a network of citations, even start measuring things like scientific impact, you know, who is reading journals, uh, you can calculate impact number for every journal, how important it is. Uh, and then in the early 2000, when data visualization started to become more popular, people started to produce visualizations of this data. So this is quite early, I think it's maybe from around 2003. So here we took data from you know, millions of scientific articles in all the different fields, Right, and uh, computer automatically connected them in this network and then visualize this network. And what you see here is which scientific fields talk to each other, right? So, in other words, if people are called professions, right, they are uh, obviously quoting lots of papers in medical research. So, you have so, we, so these two clusters are close to another, and people in earth sciences kind of have a cluster of biology. Uh, and then, social science, you can see it's kind of like yeah, it's kind of like social sciences doesn't doesn't talk to sciences that much. In humanities, it's completely at the bottom because we don't talk to anybody, right? So it's at that time, there's practically no connection between humanities and the sciences. Maybe now it's a bit different. So this was based on citations in journals. And then this is getting even more interesting. So this is uh, 2011. Uh, so in this case, we use what is called click stream data. Uh, so the idea was that um, when people go to websites, of these huge companies which publish thousands of scientific journals, you can basically get anonymous data on which papers a person clicks. Right? So first you look at this paper, when you look at that paper, and when using this data for, again, billions of clicks, we also created this network, this uh, map of science, which kind of shows you how sciences are connected. This is just a close up, right? And you have lots of different fields. Now, what is also interesting about this work is that you can, you can kind of label this map with traditional categories, which are the name of scientific fields. But you can also use it to observe the structure, right, of this phenomena, in this case, scientific research, and perhaps the clusters which don't correspond to a particular field. So one of the beautiful things about big data and uh, this kind of analysis is as opposed to starting from existing categories, right, you can, derive new categories. Um, now, one of the things which made, made possible for me, right, to be inspired by this work and to start thinking 
what we can do it with big cultural data, including images, is that um, my lab was funded by this research institute at my university, which is California, University of California, San Diego, where I was teaching at the time, which is now rated, uh, depending on the rating, like a third or 18th, somewhere between three and 18 best research university in the world. And we had labs which were creating new visualization supercomputers. So here I'm looking at the screen, uh, but it's not a static image, it's not one screen. It's actually uh, a kind of visual supercomputer which had 70 30 inch screens. And then behind it was a network of PCs of game cards. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I was predicting at the time, but sooner or later, you know, we will see these kind of systems in all the creative studios and maybe people homes. Uh, and it's going in this direction, but right, for example, the new, the brand new Macintosh computer, right? You could drive six monitors, but it's not common yet, right? I think the only people who mostly use two screens are maybe architecture students and game players. Uh, so this was already decades before its time. So here you're looking at uh, us using software we wrote uh, for the screen where we can load up to 10,000 images and we interactively sort with images and can explore uh, patterns, clusters, and so on. Okay. So as I said, uh, my research was driven by this very utopian goals, but the reason I set these utopian goals is I like to set up you know, very, very high, very, very perhaps unrealistic goals, because if you kind of set your goal, if you set your goal here, you'll get up to here. If you set your goal here, you may get up to here, right? So the idea is to kind of dream of something very crazy because you know you will not get there, but you'll get higher. Okay? So the idea was again very utopian and maybe even totalitarian. <laughs> uh, like what are the themes, topics, styles, behaviors, and patterns in contemporary global culture? How we distribute it spatially? When they emerge, how we diffuse change over time? I mean, you can compare this to because Panofsky iconography, right? But kind of doing it uh, not for history of European painting or sculpture, but doing it for you know, contemporary culture, which means looking at kind of billions of, many billions of objects being created every day. Right? Computation is possible today. Uh, I mean, Google has, right, all these data centers, but this because, you know, and deliver search results almost in real time. But if you don't do this in real time, you can actually do it. You just need good computer scientists. So here's what happened. So uh, exactly as I predicted in 2005, hundreds of museums, you know, thousands of museums and libraries have digitized millions of artworks. Right? There is so much cultural data from the past which has been digitized. And also you have this network such as Divine Art, you have Behance, Right, all these networks, professional networks were emerging 2007-2008. So Behance has an API, which is a mechanism to download the data. You know, and Behance had millions and millions of uh, professional photographs, designs, fashion designs in 70 design areas. So theoretically, you can go and download all these images, and there are some papers on Behance, and then compare, right? For example, graphic design, the photography in different cities, in different countries, or how it changes over time. So the data exists. But at the same time as the data become available, after thinking about this and doing this research for about 10 years, I started to see perhaps some fundamental issues in this whole idea. Because if you want to extract a certain number of uh, popular themes, topics, styles, behaviors. Behavior can be, for example, you know, how do people interact with architecture, right? I mean, what do people do in particular kinds of buildings? I mean, do we look around, right? Do we, what do people do in a cafe? Yeah, I mean, potentially you can have data from you know, video cameras, you know, analyze millions of, you know, million, you know, millions of, of videos, you know, and you can also perhaps cluster this into like a dozen patterns and then see what, do, what kind of behaviors people engage to worldwide, right? Uh, and the same thing, of course, you can do for, for perhaps you can imagine if you have data of architecture projects being created in all architecture schools, right? It's kind of possible theoretically to get this data because you're creating, right? Uh, you are using models, using different things, drawings, but you're also kind of making things in, you know, in, in a computer, right? Using 3D or 2D software, so potentially the data is already digital, right? And what I realize is this, right? But even if you reduce it to you know, 10 most popular uh, kind of topics or styles, or hundred or thousand, 
is still reduction, right? So if you go from your million, million uh, paintings to 100 topics, it's reduction, right? If you go from a uh, million student architecture projects and try to uh, automatically extract, let's say 50 kind of design patterns, right? Or 100 design patterns, it's still reduction. And what I started to think about is that while this idea perhaps is useful, if you kind of want to follow the average trends, this method will miss what I call small islands of cultural contents, right? So there are maybe some architecture students in a particular school or you know, different places are doing something really unique, which doesn't fit into this hundred design patterns. And because kind of modern data science uses statistics and statistics is based on reduction uh, and summarization, the statistical and data science methods are actually not designed historically to deal with outliers, right? When we analyze data, we kind of throw away outliers. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what I see as a kind of research and intellectual challenge of our time, one, one of many, right? Uh, that what the people now do today is they aggregate big cultural data, big social data, and we reduce it to a small number of patterns, which are frequently occurring ideas, themes, styles, behaviors. I mean, it's the same thing people do, right? In marketing, advertising, uh, they uh, segment their audiences, right? And then you maybe market different products to different audiences, or maybe you try to determine uh, the demographics of a person who comes to your web page, and the computer shows different versions of the web page. But the demographic information it means you take people in over variability and diversity, and you may be a different person on every day. You're not the same person yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but you're being reduced to a point in four or five, six categories. Notice this paradigm, which really uh, dominates kind of contemporary both academic research, but more importantly, the way data is used to run contemporary society, to make decisions, right? Billions of decisions per day, is focusing on what is common between a number of objects and doesn't include what occurs frequently. So when you put objects, you know, people, behaviors into these categories, right? each category means that these objects, behaviors, uh, experiences have something in common. And if something right doesn't occur very, very rarely, you just kind of throw it out. Okay. So I asked myself about four years ago, so can we refuse this dominant paradigm and to focus instead on diversity, variability and differences, including tiny differences. In other words, can we use bicultural data without aggregation? So include everything, uh, identify what I would call small cultural islands, and question the whole idea of similarity with two things or million things are similar to each other. Yes, they're similar, but if you say we're similar, you probably ignore all the subtle ways in which we're different. Um, so since we don't have, yeah, since, so what I'll do now is just to show you, actually, for the next uh, 15 minutes, right? I will show you a few projects from our lab. Now, these projects have been done between 2009 and 2015. So we actually were done before I realized this big challenge, but maybe intuitively I already felt, right? And that's why um, in 2005, when I got this idea uh, to do this cultural analytics, in my own interpretation, it meant not uh, reducing things to statistics, not doing statistical tests, not reducing things to categories, but actually displaying the full data and then uh, kind of sorting it in different ways and giving the user the ability to sort, to zoom and so on, and then allowing you to discover patterns in the data, which maybe not necessarily don't have a name, right? For emerging patterns, but also show you all the data. In my case, I was particularly interested in images. So as I said, we created the software with a computer science lab at this institute in 2009. Uh, and this is, you can see it's 2009 because monitors have big bezels. Now we don't have any bezels. Uh, and here we're looking at visualization of 1 million Monday pages and interactively exploring this visualization, right? Uh, so I'll show you a few visualizations of different data sets we have, um, but the original ones, so this was using software which I wrote myself in 2010 called ImagePlot. Um, basically, they can be 40,000 by 40,000 pixels, something like this. 
So if you zoom in, you actually see lots of detail. Um, so this was um, visualization. One million pages from manga magazines, right? So you know how manga looks, right? One of the most popular cultural forms today. Uh, and all the pages are sorted by two dimensions, by two visual characteristics measured by computer. Um, and this is the kind of close ups of the upper part and the bottom part. And it so happens, you know, that the features I measured, of course, I try to figure out what to measure. Uh, they happen to in a way, distribute this manga according to certain aesthetic dimensions, right? So the pages on the top have lots of detail. Uh, it takes more work to produce them. They're very detailed. They may be more three-dimensional. And the pages at the bottom are very bare, very minimal. They're kind of postal-like. Right? Even in between, you have every possible variations. So there are two things you learn from this, right? First of all, you kind of learn the distribution of this whole creative space of manga. Uh, I don't know how many manga, right, books and how many pages have been published by now. You know, probably dozens of millions of pages. So one million, you know, it's not everything, but it's a pretty good sample, right? One million pages from uh, about 800 books. So you can see that particular styles appear more frequently. Our visual styles appear, right, less frequently. And what you also see is that, in fact, the whole category of style doesn't work with big data. Uh, because you have a complete continuity from one extreme to another, right? Um, and then, um, so that's one, that's one work. So this is a, a different, a kind of a different project. So with my students, we try to get as many images of paintings of French Impressionists as we could. Uh, the Impressionists have been estimated to paint about 13,000 paintings and pastels. So by Impressionist, I mean around 13 artists who took place in seven uh, Impressionist exhibitions in Paris in uh, 1870s, 1880s. So we got about 5,000, that's 40% you know, because many of these paintings were never reproduced. And here uh, we actually extracted 200 features, 200 characteristics from every image. And then using the technique called principal component analysis, which is a very popular technique in data science and machine learning, the computer tries to distribute these images on the two-dimensional surface in such a way with images which are visually similar to each other are next to each other in images which are different. Are... Now you can see that, you know, it's not perfect because in fact, uh, the images can be different from each other or similar to each other in so many different dimensions. So it's kind of impossible with such a set of diverse images to perfectly organize them in 2D, but you know, more or less it's working, right? So here we have images which are very light, um, they actually landscapes, that's where we light. And then the images which are landscapes which have water are kind of close to each other, and then maybe we, we show lots of sky. And here we have another, another little cluster of images which are like this, but a bit brown. So what we found out is something very interesting, right? So normally when we think about Impressionism, or when we think about any cultural movement or cultural style or cultural figure, we rarely think about the whole output, right? Everything a person, a style, a school uh, has produced. Right? We can focus on the best work, most famous work, masterpieces, even in the case of somebody like Picasso. Right? Uh, and with images which we identify, right? Sorry, as a kind of this typical impressionism, very light, right? Colorful shadows, uh, outdoors, or maybe scenes in Paris, right? Very different from this more brown, dark, more realistic images common in the 19th century, you know, we only occupy about maybe 30% of our whole production. So maybe because, maybe maybe when we were students, or maybe when we were older, right? Or maybe simply with paintings were done in parallel. The impression is artists also to now to produce lots of images which are much more traditional, much more darker, right? So if you look at this, not as a kind of masterpiece, it's not as the best, but as everything, you really get a different map of culture. Right, so you can, again, you can imagine applying this idea to analysis of architectural trends, construction, residential buildings, you know, whatever you want historically and today, right? So, if you uh, so on that on that on, you know, on that account, right? Let's say if you visualize 20th century architecture, and uh, you take away buildings uh, and architects, which we normally read about or hear about when they take history of architecture class, 
right? So you think about like Le Corbusier, you know, Gropius and Isvan der Rohe and all the famous people. And also you take away isms, right? Constructivism, rationalism and so on, probably you'll be left with, you know, 80, 90 or maybe 95% of the rest of the buildings, which are probably eclectic because we're still building in Europe, in Asia, in 1950s, 1960s, buildings in the kind of 19th century eclectic style, right? So if you look at everything, you really get different idea of culture. And that's to me is maybe the most important thing about big data. It's not about finding some secrets about Picasso or finding who you paint, if Mona Lisa is really a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci, right? I don't really care. It's basically understanding culture in a more exclusive, more democratic way, right? So ideally I would like to write a kind of write or make a project or interactive uh, system uh, to explore a history of culture or history of painting, 19th century, or history of contemporary architecture, which will include every painting, every building, every offer to really see uh, culture as this evolutionary on a geological process, as opposed to as a small set of masterpieces. So I will show just one project and then uh, uh, we will, yes, and then we will uh, kind of have questions. Um, so this is a project I created with a group of uh, award-winning designers and also my own students in 2014 uh, called On Broadway. Uh, so the idea was to create a new visualization, interactive visualization of a city using big data, uh, both with data collected by the city, uh, such as the census data about you know, people income and uh, demographic information, but most the data which can be people generate consciously or automatically, mechanically, right? It kind of shadows we live as we go about everyday life. So images people post uh, on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, uh, for example, where, you know, where Uber rides or at that point there's no Uber, so it was taxi rides. Uh, so we collected about, I think 40 million data points. And we still realized that uh, representing whole city would be too much and we decided to limit uh, our presentation of New York to a single street, which is Broadway. Of course, you all have, right, in your mental map of Manhattan, right? So it's like Manhattan, it's kind of this vertical island and Broadway is the longest street, which is running from, uh, you know, from below uh, Wall Street all the way to the And it's about 22 kilometers. Uh, so when they started to collect the data, we can limit it to this uh, spine of Broadway we basically made a line right from the center of Broadway, and then we, and then we took the area, which is 50 meters to the left, 50 meters to the right, and then we collected all the data inside this kind of 100 meter spine, 22 kilometers by 100 meters, and we used a number of different data sources. So at the end, we got uh, about 40 million data points. So this is you know, uh, a kind of normal, right? A normal usual visualization. Uh, which shows some of this data. So imagine you have Broadway, which is vertical, you rotate it 45 degrees, so now it's horizontal. Uh, so the south of New York corresponds to the left area, the north of New York is the right area, um, and you have, uh, so you have this kind of slice. So by limiting our uh, project to a single street, right, we reduce the dimensional city to one dimension, and this allows us, right, to compare uh, volume of data for different sources uh, because our city has become one access, right? So we have uh, Instagram, Foursquare check-ins, Twitter, income data from census, and also the taxi data uh, for, for all of 2013. Uh, so I think 2013 people in New York took had about 500 plus million taxi rides and about 22 million taxi rides were along Broadway. Um, so the yellow, I think, responds to like the points where people got into the taxi, and blue corresponds to a point where we get off of a taxi. Uh, of course, it's completely anonymized, and you know, we never, never like like you know like like a good scientist, we never actually look at the user data. We just basically look at the patterns. So this is nice, right? But in a way, it's a kind of traditional statistical, almost scientific representation, and we wanted to create something more sensual, something more visual, something more interactive, and really create a new image of a city, right? a data city. So what we've done is that we uh, 
in a way, uh, turn each each axis, each you know, each layer, into set of images because our data is very visual, right? So one layer is Instagram images. Uh, the next layer is the images of New York, which we downloaded from Google Street View. You can download their data, uh, and then some layers are visualizations of this data, right? So here you have all these layers, and next I'll show you a very short video, which is recorded from a screen, which shows you how we interact with this interactive visualization in real time. Uh, so the project was a commission for New York Public Library, and then it was shown in about a dozen places, including uh, one of architecture manuals in Shanghai, uh, and you know, number of our places, including a couple of architecture design events. Oh, sorry, just did something. Okay, let me just see. Okay, here we go. And there's no sound. So this is just interface loading. So here you have all these layers. So what happens is that uh, right, if you zoom out, if you kind of push out, right, we display, we used 42 inch interactive display. Now we're a bigger displays. So if you kind of zoom out, you'll see the whole 22 kilometers on the screen. And then you can sample images accordingly so you get very narrow stripes from these images, and also you get summary statistics, right? So you will see square check-ins, Twitter messages, Instagram photos, and you get these numbers, which may correspond to the average for the whole block. But you can also pinch in, zoom out, and then you can travel from a city kind of 30 meters at a time. Why 30 meters? Because it turned out at the time when the Google cars, which photograph a city for Google Street View, we were taking pictures every 30 meters, so that becomes our kind of walking step. Uh, and then uh, you see more of the images. I'll just kind of play it. I'll just play it again. You see more of the images, right? So now the sampling is less, and the statistics also updated. So now you are, you know, so now you are uh, seeing statistics for like 30 meter, right? So in a way, it's a bit like a virtual globes so again, like a Google or, or Microsoft or our uh, kind of virtual earth, right? Except instead of superimposing these maps on top of each other, we create this new map of a city which doesn't have a map, right? So what's the best way to create a map of a city? Make something with a new representation, a new interface, a new paradigm made from uh, visual data and also our kind of data and uh, our brilliant designer, Moritz Stefaner, who got more awards for his data visualization than in fact any designer in the world. So we did two projects with him. I was very, very lucky. I created this beautiful interface where you zoom in, you kind of see more images. And if you zoom out, you see less, but you still take a few pixels from every image. So you still get uh, a certain sense, a certain sense what you're looking for. I'll just show you, I'll just play one last time because it's very quick. i just show you one more thing. What happens if you sample these images from Google Street View? <laughs> so this is Google Street View, right? This. So we are looking up. Uh, so now, right, we zoomed in and we see like a bigger part of each image, right? And um, in fact, the area where we are, we see full image, like accordion, right? Um, and then we zoom out, right? Now each image is sampled and now you get like the image always become data, but we still retain something in the image. And that was a very important idea for me, uh, which it runs as also as a kind of spine for all our projects, is to not reduce the data to statistics, not to reduce data to some categories or clusters, but instead, right, not to replace in a way human vision, human cultural vision, human cultural perception of a computer, but instead augment human culture perception, human ability to see patterns and also see tiny details which make a difference uh, by giving people new visualizations and new interfaces. Um, so I think uh, I will stop here. Thank you, Lev, very much.